Book 2, Growing Up, Chapter 18, A Learning Period Part 2 A month had passed after Lindley had become a magus of the second rank. Within the first grade when magic classroom. Lindley would only go to the earth magic class once every month or so, but he attended every single wind magic class. Today, Lindley was seated in his usual spot. Lindley, you came. Just as Lindley sat down, a very adorable young lady sat down next to him. Seeing the girl, Lindley smiled. Delia, you came pretty early. There's still quite some time before the next class starts. Sitting together with a beautiful girl was of course something enjoyable. Naturally, Lindley wouldn't push her away. Delia was no ordinary person. Her brother, Dixie, was the number one genius of the entire Ernst Institute, and described as a talent which would be found once in a century at most. He, too, was a dual element mage, and his elemental essence affinity was exceptional. But what's more, he was a supreme talent with 68 times the spiritual lessons of an ordinary person. As the sister of Dixie, Delia nationally was pretty exceptional as well. It's because I know you always come early. Delia beamed, her eyes crinkling. The two sat together and chatted. Time passed quite quickly, and before they realized it, class had started. Instructor Trey energetically explained in front, and Lindley sat beneath him, listening intently. But Delia, every so often, would sneak a peek at Lindley. All right, today's class is over for now. But before class ends, there's something I must inform you all about. Instructor Trey smiled as he spoke. All of the students immediately began to buzz. The older students all know that our Ernst Institute has a tradition. At the last two months of every year, a yearly tournament will be held. The yearly tournament is always the most noisy, energetic time at the Ernst Institute. The students who achieve victory in the yearly tournament will likely have a higher chance of being rated superior upon their graduation. When they graduate, most likely they will be invited by the four great empires. Instructor Trey laughed. All of the students below immediately began to grow excited. At the Ernst Institute, talents were as common as the clouds. And the number one problem that all talents shared was that they didn't like to admit inferiority to others. Thus, the yearly tournament had become a way for talents to become famous. Close to 90% of the students would pay attention to the tournament, and everyone with some ability would participate. Naturally, we wide magic practitioners will also do battle. Everyone interested in enrolling, please speak to me. Instructor Trey smiled as he spoke, but his gaze drifted towards Lindley. Instructor, I wish to enroll. Many students below immediately began to clamor to enroll. Great. Instructor Trey took out a duck feather quill pen and began to record down names, but after taking down ten or so names, he realized that Lindley was busy chatting with Delia, apparently not interested in enrolling at all. Trey walked over. Lindley involuntarily glanced up and immediately called out respectfully, Instructor Trey. The nearby Delia also paid her respects. Trey smiled and nodded. Lindley, this yearly tournament is an excellent opportunity to train one's self. I expect all of the elites of the first grade students will attend. Why aren't you enrolling? This is a rare opportunity. I'm not interested. Lindley said directly. Instructor Trey couldn't help but start. Lindley, you no doubt are unaware that the victors of the tournament will receive some rewards. Instructor Trey said enticingly. Rewards? Lindley was in desperate need of money. His clan's economic situation was in such terrible shape. If he could win some money, he wouldn't mind attending the yearly tournament. Right. You should know that most students live in ordinary dorms, those single unit ones. But the top three victors of the tournament are all qualified to live in those two story high buildings for a year. That's a proof of status. The rooms are much more comfortable as well. Instructor Trey continued. Lindley understood. There weren't many two floor dorms, and most of those belonged to powerful magi of the seventh or eighth ranks. From what he was now hearing, the top three students in each grade also were allowed to live in them. Housing conditions? Lindley didn't care about it at all. I'm not attending, Lindley still said. 
Instructor Trey grew somewhat impatient. As a sixth grade student, if one of Trey's students became one of the top three in his grade, not only would he be rewarded, he would also gain a lot of face. Young people all cared about face. Instructor Trey leaned in towards Lindley, saying in a low voice, Lindley, are you concerned about revealing your ability? I know that you are a magus of the second rank. Hearing these words, Lindley couldn't help but look up at Trey in surprise. How did Instructor Trey learn about his current level of power? After all, it was hard to judge one's abilities from external appearances. Seeing the expression on Lindley's face, Instructor Trey thought that he had hit the mark. Laughing, he said, Lindley, if you have ability, you shouldn't hide it. Even if you decide not to attend the competition for fear of revealing your ability, I might just decide to expose you myself. Whatever. Still not going. Lindley stood up unhappily, and then politely paid his respects. Farewell, instructor. And then, ignoring the stupefied look on Trey's face, he immediately left. Bah. This kid. After recovering, Trey couldn't help but laugh. The nearby Delia couldn't help but cover her mouth and giggle as well. Dot. By the time the wind magic class had ended, it was almost six at night. The sky was growing dark. Lindley ran back towards his dorm. The brothers of dorm 1987 shared strong affection towards each other, and at night they always ate together. Lindley, you're back. A curly-haired youngster from dorm 1986 said warmly to Lindley. Harry, Hallie, have you eaten dinner? Lindley smiled back in response. Lindley was on excellent relations with most of the nearby neighbors. Harry laughed and nodded. Of course I have. Your three brothers are all waiting for you inside. Lindley's back. Let's go, everyone, time to eat. Yale's voice sounded out. Clearly, from inside their dorm, Yale had heard Lindley's voice. Yale, Reynolds, and George all walked out and waved to Lindley. The four brothers proceeded towards the dining areas. The Ernst Institute contained some luxurious restaurants, but after being persuaded by Lindley, Reynolds, and George, Yale no longer took them to those places. The dishes in the small dining hall were simple and fresh, very pleasing to eat. After ordering some food, the four brothers began to chat amongst themselves. Lindley got most of his news regarding the Institute's going-ons from his three brothers, as Lindley, who spent all his time training in the mountain probably would be totally in the dark otherwise. Man, in about a month, the school year is coming to an end. The last two months of each year, the entire institute will engage in the yearly tournament. The top three students in each grade are all allowed to live in those two-story dorms for a year, Yale said. The yearly tournament? Lindley began to laugh. He had just heard about this from the classroom. Ha ha, I'm definitely attending. Reynolds said confidently. Yale pursed his lips. Punk, you became a magus of the first rank on the road from the O'Brien Empire to the Ernst Institute. I wager that by now, you aren't too off from becoming the magus of the second rank. That really is unfair. Reynolds spent a full year traveling from his home to come here. On the entire journey, Reynolds' family housekeeper has been teaching him magic which is why he had become a magus of the first rank even before the journey ended. George smiled towards Lindley. Ha, you are forgetting about Lindley. Lindley was a magus of the first rank by the time he entered the institute as well. What's more, he's crazy about training, and he's a dual element magus. I think he's probably the strongest person in our dorm. Lindley quirked his lips in a smile. George, don't flatter me. Lindley. Have you gained your second rank yet? Be were honest? George stared at Lindley. How could he gain his second rank so quickly? From an introductory student to the first rank, based on our talent, a year is necessary. But from the first rank to the second rank, at least two years is needed. The nearby Reynolds frowned as he spoke. Not necessarily. I also feel Lindley's been really sneaky. Yale also looked at Lindley. Lindley. Have you become a magus of the second rank? Lindley casually nodded. What was the big deal about becoming a magus of the second rank? Even before the magus testing event, he had already become a magus of the first rank. A full year had passed since then. 
If he still had not become a magus of the second rank, then all his hard work would have been totally pointless. You really reached it? Yale, Reynolds, and George's eyes all bulged out. None of them expected it to be true. Go enlist in the yearly tournament, Lindley. You've gotta take part. Give those guys a good trampling and gain some prestige for dorm 1987. Yale immediately said. By now, the servers had brought the dishes they ordered. Eat, eat. I'm not interested in the yearly tournament. Lindley had no interest in competing with those weaker than himself. Those tournament battles were nothing more than exercises and showing off. Yale and the other three traded glances. They all knew how hard Lindley trained. Although in their year, there were geniuses who had exceptional levels of elemental affinity and spiritual essence, in terms of being hardworking, none of them could match Lindley. And with Lindley being dual element dot in their hearts, all of them believed that Lindley was most likely the most powerful amongst the first grade students. It would be such a waste if you didn't participate. Someone else is going to get the glory, once again, in the yearly tournament. Yale mumbled. Too bad I'm not strong enough. If I had your strength, Lindley, I would have given a dazzling display long ago. Then, I would be able to seduce some pretty girls. Lindley laughed. That's enough. Let's eat. Stop fantasizing. Lindley really didn't care about the yearly tournament in the slightest. But the vast majority of the students at the Ernst Institute were extremely excited about it. And not just the students. Even some of the full magi residing at the Ernst Institute would pay close attention to the tournament results. Book 2, Growing Up, Chapter 19, Who is Number 1? Part 1. The Mountain Behind the Ernst Institute, A Place of Tranquility. Lindley sat cross-legged next to flowing water. Listening to the murmurs of the water, he naturally entered the meditative trance, and all of the nearby earth essence and wind essence immediately began to shine. Everything within 10 or so meters around Lindley became extremely clear to behold. Earth and wind essence entered his body through his forelimbs, as his flesh, bones, and organs all slowly absorbed nourishment from the essences. Slowly but resolutely, the strength of his body was continuing to climb. Additionally, a large portion of the wind and earth essences, after purification, came to rest with the central dention in the middle of his chest. Splash, splash. The flowing water murmured unceasingly. Next to him, the little shadow mouse, Bebe, was chewing on a wild duck. The scene was a peaceful as a painting, as though it had come out of a painting. But while it was peaceful here, the Ernst Institute was extremely rowdy. All of the thousands of students, as well as many of the magi, and even many important people from the outside world were all at the Ernst Institute, watching the various battles. The yearly tournament. All of the students of the Ernst Institute were prideful heaven blessed talents. Each and every single battle was amazing to behold. Amongst the first grade students, balls of earth, flashes of lightning, and blades of wind flew hither and to. But the battles of the third and fourth grade students were really astounding. Various supportive spells and area of effect spells were used. Spells such as Shattered Rocks now caused dozens, approaching a hundred of large stones to smash upon the heads of the opponents, and lightning forked down without stopping. And the fifth and sixth graders? That was all the more terrifying. All sorts of astounding spells continuously flashed, filling the compound with unending sounds of explosions. The watching students all were all roaring non-stop, as the energy was reaching a crescendo. Virtually all of the people in the institute were here. Dot. The yearly tournament went on for a bit over a month, which nationally was the wildest, most rowdy month each year at the Ernst Institute. During this frenetic period, Lindley would only occasionally watch the battles of the 5th and 6th grade students. All of the rest of his time, he would quietly train by himself. This tournament actually requires one to not intentionally try and kill one's opponent. How can this sort of competition be considered a real competition? when one's hands and feet are tied. Under the influence of Doran Cowart, Lindley, too, began to view the competition with disdain. Lindley, your current assignment is to train hard and build up your strength. As far as combat experience goes, when you become a magus of the fifth rank, 
you should enter the mountain range of magical beasts and enter a series of genuine life and death experiences. Doran Coward persuaded Lindley. Dot. The Wadley Hotel, the most expensive hotel and restaurant within the Ernst Institute. Tonight, Yale was hosting the Four Brothers of Dorm 1987 to a lavish meal at the Wadley Hotel. On the first floor of the Wadley Hotel. The floor of the hotel was as slick as a mirror. A row of beautiful waitresses stood there politely, ready to answer at a moment's notice. There were many men and women dressed in student attire at the Wadley Hotel. Those who were able to afford this place were generally those who had strong economic backgrounds. A casual table of dishes might cost a few dozen gold coins. If Linley had come by himself, he definitely wouldn't be able to afford it. The yearly tournament had just ended, and all of the students at the hotel were discussing it. Most of the people here were youngsters, but one table was filled with four children. I'm pissed just thinking about this year's competition. It was so close. I was so close to entering the semi-finals. Maybe I would have been able to enter the top three. Reynolds was extremely dissatisfied. Reynolds was the youngest of the four, and also the proudest of them. Yale laughed. It really was a shame. I didn't expect Rand, Land, to become number one in the end. George chuckled but didn't speak. George was a friendly fellow and offended almost nobody. Rand? Right. I've heard you guys discuss him before. He was one of the new students who had exceptional elemental affinity and spiritual lessons, right? Lindley remembered the name Rand. George laughed and nodded. Right, him. He has very high talent. Even before training, his spiritual lessons had reached the level of Omegas of the second rank. All he did this year was accumulate sufficient much force. It isn't too hard for someone with the power of Omegas of the second rank to become number one in the tournament amongst first grade students. Relying on his talent alone? When it comes to talent, can he compare to our institute's number one genius, Dixie? Yale quirked his lips. I look down upon Rand. He won the first grade tournament, so what? Lindley, you didn't see how self-satisfied he looked upon winning. I really can't imagine how he would look if he actually were to win the fifth or sixth grade tournaments in the future. The stronger Omegas became, the harder it was to progress even further. This was why the large majority of students at the Ernst Institute were high-level Magi. The higher one's grade was, the fiercer the competition was. Reynolds nodded as well. I also don't like him. Our school's number one genius, the third grader Dixie, won the third grade tournament. Look at how composed he was. The difference between the two is too huge. What's more, the strongest amongst us first graders isn't Rand. Right. Third bro, you didn't participate. If you had, HMPH. Yale harumphed. Based on age and seniority, the four of them had begun to address each other as second bro, third bro, and so on. Hey, what are you guys saying? Linley and Yale turned their heads. Four youths in the same hotel were making their way down from the second floor. Their leader, a golden-haired youth, stared at Linley's group coldly. Yale said loudly, Oh, so it's Rand. What, didn't you hear what we were saying? Lindley couldn't help but laugh helplessly to himself. Yale feared neither heaven nor hell, and cared tremendously about face. HMPH, don't think I didn't hear, Rand said coldly. The brown-haired youth next to Rand sneered as well. He arrogantly said, Rand, don't quibble with these four useless things. It's not worth your time. Reynolds, what do you think you are looking at? What, you aren't satisfied with the way you lost in the tournament? Reynolds stared at the brown-haired youth, his mouth corking in disdain. And what do you think you are? You just got lucky and beat me once. Why so cocky? The brown-haired youth's face grew cold. George smiled at everyone. Rand, enough. It was wrong of us to so casually discuss you. Let's just forget about it. Shut your mouth, George. This is none of your business. Rand stared at Yale. Yale, last time I saw you at the Fragrant Helm Bar, your arrogant manner pissed me off. And now, this time, you dare to be so arrogant in front of me. If you have the ability, 
come and fight me. Why don't you have the balls to fight? After speaking, Ren intentionally laughed mockingly a few times. Although Yale was somewhat furious, he knew that he wasn't as strong as the opponent. Immediately, many gazes from all over the hotel focused on this altercation. Many of the high-level students of the Ernst Institute stood up and stared at the two parties with curiosity. Clearly, both parties were just ten-year-olds. I know that golden-haired kid. His name is Rand. He won the yearly tournament amongst first graders. I expect in the future, he'll have some accomplishments. The brown-haired kid next to him is called Rickson, Ruison. He was number three amongst the first graders. I know him. In terms of strength, Rand's party is stronger than their opponents. This should be fun. The group of Magi of the fifth and sixth ranks all chatted and laughed, watching the two parties. Seeing others notice him, and hearing them praise him as the winner of the first grade tournament, Rand's face became even more arrogant, and he looked at Linley and the others even more contemptuously. H.M.P.H. Rand glanced at the table where Linley and the others were sitting. Juice. You guys are still drinking juice. Oh, Yale, I really feel embarrassed for you. The four brothers of my dorm are all drinking victory wine. You guys are drinking juice. Seeing how Rand went on endlessly, Lindley couldn't help but begin to frown. Rand, we four brothers are eating here. Get the hell out. Lindley's face sank down, and he stared coldly at the four of them. If he was training and was disturbed by beasts, he would immediately kill them. Oh, and this one. Rand's eyes shone as he stared at Lindley. How come I never knew that in Yale's dorm, there was someone such as you? Lindley's gaze grew cold. Like a wild rabbit, he shot forward with incredible speed. Rand's eyes only had time to widen. You! Before he could even react, Lindley grabbed Rand by the chest and, just based on physical strength, hoisted him in the air. Wah, uh, uh. Rand couldn't make any noises come from his throat, and his eyes were filled with fear. Lindley stared coldly at Rand. Rand, heart filled with fear, felt as though he would be killed at any moment. At this moment, Lindley felt the dragon blood in his veins begin to blaze, as his bloodthirsty nature began to awaken. Lindley couldn't help but frown as he tried to calm down. This is the Ernst Institute. I can't kill someone for no reason. The three students next to Rand were all stupefied and frightened as well. Fuck off. With a wave of an arm, Lindley slammed Rand to the floor, as though he were nothing more than a beanbag. Book 2, Growing Up Chapter 20, Who is Number 1? Part 2 By now, Lindley had nearly reached the peak of the second rank for warriors. Given that the strength of an ordinary warrior of the first rank was enough to raise a hundred pounds, a warrior of the second rank could casually throw about hundred pound objects. U. Cough. Cough. Holding his throat, Rand coughed a few times, and then stared furiously at Lindley. U. You actually. Yeah. Yale suddenly shouted loudly, his face filled with excitement. That felt so good. Third bro, I didn't expect you to be as strong as that. That kid is pretty small, but he is so strong. Those magi of the fifth and sixth ranks were all astonished. There were some magus instructors in the hotel as well, and all of them were staring at Linley with surprise. A kid who appeared to be perhaps 12 or 13 years old was able to casually toss a 90-pound person with one hand. And this youth was a magus. Hey, Rand, weren't you bragging about how you were number one amongst the first graders? Yale mocked. Rand's face went red, as his heart was filled with fury and shame. Staring at Linley, he shouted fiercely, You, are you a magus? If you have the skills, compete with me using magic. What sort of behavior was that? A noble magus actually used the lowly skills of a warrior. Rand was filled with anger and humiliation. He had just won the yearly tournament for the first graders, but just now, when Linley seized him by the throat and hoisted him up, he had been filled with a terrifying sense that his life was in the hands of another. Right, if you have the skills, compete using magic. Are you even a student of the Ernst Institute? Rand's nearby friends immediately called out in support. But towards Lindley, the four of them felt some dread in their hearts. 
Lin Li's astonishing display of strength just now had shocked them. Magic? Reynolds immediately began to laugh loudly, as he said arrogantly, Rand, do you actually believe that just because you won the first grade tournament, you really are the strongest amongst the first graders? Dream on. The number one first grader is our dorm's third bro. You? Step off to the side. Third bro, show me a bit of your power. Yale urged as well. George had just been yelled at by Rand, so right now, he was in no mood to give Rand any face either. Rand, let me tell you something. Know your own limits. Many of the experts in our school simply don't deign to participate in the yearly tournament. Don't really believe that you are something special. Rand's face grew uglier and uglier. You'll know the truth upon dueling. Rand, compete with them. Those 5th and 6th grade students called out laughingly. They viewed the struggles of the 1st graders as nothing more than an amusing diversion. Rand was just 10 years old, after all, and had been called a genius since he was little. Even at the Ernst Institute, he was amongst the top tier. When had he ever suffered such humiliation? Number 1. Rand ground out. Number 1 isn't something that is simply proclaimed. It comes through competition. If you have the ability, then come duel with me. Rand was very confident in his magical ability. After all, he had won the yearly tournament for first graders. Hey, why isn't the manager of this hotel coming in to calm things down? Some of the onlookers felt surprised and curious about this. In fact, the Waddley Hotel manager was standing far away, but he didn't want to interfere. Because he recognized these students. Even aside from the fact that these were students from the Ernst Institute, based on the status of these students, he didn't want to anger them. Especially Dot Yale. Young Master Yale is here? Ugh! Forget it. He can do as he wishes. Even if he smashes the entire hotel, it's none of my business. The hotel manager rubbed and shook his head helplessly. He couldn't dare to offend young Master Yale. And upon entering the Ernst Institute, Yale's status amongst his family had only increased even more. Well spoken. Number one isn't self-proclaimed. It's one. Lindley stood up as well, his face cold as he stared at Rand. Rand, if we are going to engage in a magical duel, let's make it exciting. If you win, when I see you in the future, I'll have to take the long way and avoid crossing paths with you. If I win, you need to do the same. Rand couldn't help but sneer, you call that exciting? When the loser meets the winner, not only does he have to take the long way around, he also has to give a hundred gold coins. How about that? Lindley frowned. A hundred gold coins? He only had a hundred gold coins each year for living expenses. He wasn't rich like some people. Ha <laughs> ha. Rand, just a hundred gold coins? Aren't you embarrassed, saying such a number? How about this? Loser pays 10,000 gold. Deal? The nearby Yale said loudly. 10,000 gold? Upon hearing these words, many students in the hotel sucked in a cold breath. 10,000 gold coins was not a small sum. There were perhaps only a very few number of students in the hotel who could so casually, calmly bring out such a large sum. 10,000 gold? Rand couldn't help but feel his heart shake. Although his clan was a large one, each year, he only received 3,000 golden living expenses. He didn't come spend money at the Waddley Hotel every day. Today, he only came to celebrate him and Rickson becoming the number one and number three victors of the tournament. Ha ha, don't have the balls? Yale pulled out a magic guard, waving it around as he spoke. Rand, agree to him. Rickson said. We four brothers should be able to pull together 10,000 gold coins. I refuse to believe that this little punk who came out of nowhere can be a match for you. Rand and his three brothers glanced at each other. Fine. 10,000 gold it is. Rand said loudly, and then sneered towards Lindley, let's go. This place is too small. We'll go to the arena where the tournament was held. If you have courage, follow me. After speaking. Rand arrogantly left the hotel, and his three brothers followed him. Let's go. Yale's eyes were shining. Reynolds and George were also excited. 
Linley nodded as well as he calmly chuckled, someone wants to give us 10,000 gold? How can we refuse? Linley, Yale, Reynolds, and George all left the hotel as well, directly heading for the arena. The entire hotel was now in an uproar. A duel with a 10,000 gold coin wager on it was rarely seen, even by 6th grade students. And what's more, of the duelists, one was the person who had just won the yearly tournament for first graders, Rand, and one was a mysterious kid that no one knew. Immediately, many people paid their tabs and headed off in that direction as well. Dot. The arena floor was made of limestone and extremely sturdy. Right now, Rand and Lindley were each standing on a separate side of an arena dueling area. Beneath the upraised dueling area was a large group of people. After all, this was dinner time, so on the way here from the Waddley Hotel, one person became ten, and ten became a hundred. In a short period of time, a large group of people had been gathered. This exciting duel with a ten thousand gold wager was more than enough to attract many onlookers. Seeing how many people had come and how noisy it had become, a look of confidence appeared on Rand's face. Today, I am going to engage in a magical duel with this kid Linley, with the loser paying 10,000 gold coins and having to avoid the other in the future. Everyone, please be my witnesses. Rand said. He enjoyed the feeling of being watched by many. He didn't suffer from any stage fright at all. Immediately, many cheers exploded from below. During the yearly tournament, Rand had many supporters, while in contrast, very few people were supporting Linley. But Linley just stood there on the dueling area quietly. Said enough? Linley said calmly. Rand smiled arrogantly. Let's go. Rand and Linley almost simultaneously began to chant the words to a spell. As both were magi of the second rank, the spells they used were all of the first and second rank and were easy to cast requiring just a word or two. Whoosh! Seven sharp blades of wind sprang into existence, slicing directly towards Rand. Omegas of the second drank? The experienced onlookers could immediately tell. But Rand had released a spell at the same time, and five balls of dull red flame shot towards Linley as well. The blades of wind were much faster than the fireballs, however, and Rand was forced to dodge in a rather sorry fashion. But Linley casually and effectively sidestepped the fireballs. And, while doing so, Linley's lips continued to move as he executed his second spell. Earth style magic, Earth Tremor, Rumble. Rand felt the limestone beneath his feet begin to tremble violently. Under these circumstances, Rand couldn't focus enough to chant any spells. Immediately afterwards, Linley released his third spell and five fists of earth and colored stone shot out rapidly towards him. Rand couldn't even maintain his footing on the shaking earth. He just barely dodged two of the stones. Thud. One stone smashed into Rand's stomach, immediately causing him to vomit fresh blood. Rand hurriedly used his arms to cover his chest. Two more striking sounds were heard, and Rand was directly thrown off the dueling area, his entire body covered with dust. Magic duel, Linley, victorious. Linley calmly glanced at Rand once. Linley was very clear about the attack he had just used. With just a month's recovery time at most, Ren would be fine. If he, Linley, had decided to be merciless, he could have directed the stones at Rand's head and most likely finished him. A dual element magus of the second rank. We have such an expert amongst us first graders? The onlooking first graders called out, astonished. For a second rank magus to appear amongst the first graders was a rare event, much less a dual element magus, who would be the absolute strongest amongst them. This kid controlled his match force very precisely, and his body movements were very nimble. Some of the fifth and sixth graders were a bit surprised. Just now, when facing the fireballs, Linley had been able to dodge while continuing to chant the words to a spell. From this one could tell how agile Linley was. Ha ha, Rand, did you really think you were number one? Our dorm's third bro, just using magic, is still able to easily trample you. Yell laugh loudly. Cough, cough. Rand stood up, clutching his chest. Rand knew in his heart that just then, Linley had shown mercy. 
Yale, tomorrow, bring Lindley. I'll go with you to the Golden Bank of the Four Empires local branch to transfer money. 10,000 golds. I'll keep my word. Rand took a long look at the distant Lindley. This defeat at Lindley's hands had totally woken Rand up from the arrogant haze of being a genius. Even if one was talented, if one wasn't strong enough, he would still be defeated by others. Lindley, thank you. Rand said, bowing, causing Yale and others to be startled. And then, Rand stared at Lindley and said resolutely, But there will come a day when I will defeat you. And then Rand, still clutching his chest, left with the help of his brothers, returning to his own residence. Lindley, you are too awesome. You won your brothers a lot of face. Reynolds immediately ran over and embraced Lindley, who had stepped down. Lindley glanced around. Many people were now staring at him and discussing him. Most of the talented people at the Ernst Institute had become well known already. Nobody expected such an individual to appear out of nowhere amongst the first graders and easily defeat Rand, the tournament champion. Hi Lindley, my name is Danny, Danai, a water magus of the first rank. I'm glad to meet you. Immediately, a golden-haired girl with a tall, slender figure walked over and said to Lindley with a smile. Hi, my name is Lindley. Lindley didn't have the habit of talking to strangers much. Sorry, I'm going to go train and enter the meditative trance now. After speaking, Lindley glanced expressively at his three brothers Yale and the others knew what he was thinking, and immediately, the four brothers ignored everyone around them and departed leaving behind that young lady, Danny, who frowned unhappily. Book 2, Growing Up, Chapter 21, The Pruel Gallery Part 1 The Golden Bank of the Four Empires was a bank that had been jointly established by the Yulon Continent's four great empires. People who were capable of opening a magic crystal card account with the bank were undoubtedly people of great wealth. Given that the card itself cost a hundred gold coins, Normal people wouldn't be willing to part with such a high sum. 10,000 gold coins, if divided into hand sized pouches, would fill a hundred pouches. Even a burlap rice sack would be half filled and very heavy. A hundred gold coins, gone like that. Walking out from the local branch of the Golden Bank of the Four Empires within the Ernst Institute, Lindley couldn't help but sigh to himself. Now, next to his chest, was a magic crystal card of his own. Lindley knew that while he continued to live at the Ernst Institute, if he put a huge pile of gold coins in his dorm, it wouldn't be safe. The safest option was to put them all in a magic crystal card. It must be known that the cost to create the card was not low. It had taken master goldsmiths centuries to develop, and each card responded to the fingerprints of its owner alone. Thus, every single magic crystal card could only be used by its original owner. This was the reason why magic crystal cards cost a hundred gold coins. With these 10,000 gold coins, my living expenses at the Ernst Institute will be more than sufficiently covered, with lots left over. I can help father as well. Lindley felt very happy. Yale's arm was around Lindley's shoulders, and he whistled a little tune while delightedly peering at the nearby Rand and his brothers. Rand and the other three had taken out their living expenses money and the four of them had perhaps only a thousand gold coins left. But fortunately, the school year was about to end. Reynolds and George were both calmly smiling as well, and were joking with Lindley to the side. But in truth, neither Reynolds nor George had suffered much in the past. Second bro, third bro, fourth bro, tomorrow, at the end of the month, my father will come over. At that time, I will arrange for carriages and guardsmen to be brought over. Where should we four brothers travel to? Yale suggested. The holy capital. Reynolds, George, and Lindley's eyes all shone. Finlay City, the holy capital, was no ordinary city. The holy capital is a great idea. On the way here from the O'Brien Empire, I stayed at Finlay City for two days. I haven't had a chance to visit many places yet. Reynolds hurriedly said. George and Lindley both nodded. The holy capital has lots of places to visit. Tomorrow, I'll take you guys out and expand your horizons. Yale said mysteriously. Dot. At dawn the next day, Yale and the others all had breakfast together, 
and then directly went to the Ernst Institute's main gate and began waiting for Yale's escorted carriage. After waiting for two hours, the carriage still had not arrived. Squeak squeak. Bebe, perched on Lindley's shoulder, began to squeak. Bebe is getting impatient. Yale, you pulled us all here early in the morning, but the carriage still hasn't come. Reynolds said unhappily, while Yale laughed apologetically. I don't know either, they should be here by now. Lindley just stroked Bebe's little head. There they are. Yale suddenly shouted loudly. George, Reynolds, and Lindley, all of whom had almost fallen asleep, turned to look. From afar, there really was four carriages and hundreds of mounted guardsmen hurrying towards them en masse. Above the formation, there were even seven or eight griffins, and of the hundreds of riders, over ten were riding magical beasts such as the vampiric iron bull or wind wolves. So Yale's Klankar divisions are so formidable. Lindley couldn't help but feel shocked. The eyes of Reynolds and George also shone. Doran Coward was seated next to Lindley, enjoying the sun. Upon seeing the cavalry division, his eyes lit up as well. Very shortly, the four carriages and hundreds of riders arrived at the main gate. Three magi came out to greet them at the gate. A middle-aged man stepped forward in front of the four carriages. Before even speaking to the three magi, he strode towards Yale. Second uncle, what took you guys so long? Yale said unhappily. This second uncle of Yale's immediately laughed and said, Ha ha, did you grow impatient? All right, your carriages are all ready. The last one is filled with some goods, I'll have them clear them out so you have a place to sit. You're going to the holy capital, right? Cass, cocky, take three others with you. You are responsible for protecting young Master Yale. This second uncle ordered. Off in the distance, a bald rider immediately dismounted, walked in front of Yale, and bowed. Cash pays his respects to young Master Yale. Next to Lindley, Doreen Cowart's eyes lit up and he said to him, Lindley, this brother of yours definitely is extraordinary. Based on how he dismounted and his eyes, I can feel that this Cass is an expert who is a good deal stronger than even your Uncle Hillman. In addition, that hawk on his shoulder should be a magical beast of the seventh rank, the blue eyed thunder hawk. For Cass to be praised by Doreen Coward as an expert meant that he definitely was out of the ordinary. Lindley, let's go. Enter the carriage quickly. Let's go to the holy capital. Yale beckoned. Lindley and the other three entered the carriage together. The interior was very spacious, and the four of them weren't cramped at all. Immediately, the carriage driver began heading towards the direction of the Finlay city, the holy capital. Cass and the other three riders all followed from behind. In the cabinets within the carriage, there were actually fruits, honey, and wine. The four brothers began to eat and drink and chat within the carriage. The Ernst Institute was only 20 kilometers away from Finlay city, so after about half an hour or so, they arrived. They left the carriage. Under the protection of Cass and the other three, Lindley's group began to roam Finlay City. Hey, where is everyone going? Finlay City has an incredible amount of places to have fun. East Finlay City has lots of luxurious places to spend money with lots of beautiful waitresses, while West Finlay City has many art museums, such as the famous Brule Gallery. Yale was very familiar with Finlay City. Beautiful waitresses? Okay okay. Let's go to East Finlay City. The eyes of that mischievous scamp Reynolds had begun to shine. It's only the afternoon. Those places are only fun in the evening. But of course, we can go now as well. Yale said laughingly. Lindley felt some reservations about those types of places, and so he said, Yale, forget it, what's the point of us kids going to those places? Just now, you mentioned the Pruel Gallery? Since the Pruel Gallery names itself after the famous Grand Master Pruel, it must be extraordinary. Let's go check it out. Pruel, the number one sculptor in the history of the Yulam continent. Grand Master Pruel? I've heard of him as well. In the past, one of his sculptures was sold for the price of several million gold coins. The name of that sculpture was Hope. Millions of gold coins, my god. So rich. Reynolds sighed. George laughed confidently. 
In the history of sculpture, from the beginning till now, there have been countless stone sculptures made. Of the top 10 sculptures, any one of them would be worth a million gold coins. And of those top 10 sculptures, three were made by Grandmaster Perul. He can be considered the number one person in the history of stone sculpting. Lindley sucked in a breath of cold air. Millions of gold coins? What an enormous sum that was. Even if his clan sold off their ancestral home, they most likely would only be able to scrape up a hundred thousand gold coins. Let's go check it out. Lindley immediately said. Book 2, Growing Up, Chapter 22, The Parole Gallery, Part 2 the Parole Gallery. The number one art gallery for sculptures, each of the largest cities in the Yolam continent had a Parole Gallery branch. The Parole Gallery took up an extremely large space, and a great majority of those entering the gallery were people of culture and breeding. Within the Parole Gallery, if you had too many ostentatious magic rings on your hands, the likely result would just be you being mocked and derided for having no class. Art, Sophistication this place valued these things the most. The entry fee to the Pruel Gallery was one gold coin per person. A ding-dong sound, as clear as the sound of a mountain spring, rang out from within the Pruel Gallery. The sound of it made listeners feel at peace. Countless people traversed the gateway, with many noblemen, noble women, and beautiful young girls, all dressed very tastefully. And commoners, in front of the Pruel Gallery would almost unconsciously comport themselves. When Lindley and his brothers, along with Cass and the three guardsmen, arrived at the Parole Gallery, anyone who was a decent judge of character could recognize the Ernst Institute clothing that they wore. Upon seeing the blue-eyed thunderhawk on Cass' shoulders, they naturally would become very courteous and polite. Uncle Cass, come in along with us. The other three can wait for us outside. Yale instructed. Lindley his three brothers, and Cass thus entered the gallery. In the main hall of the Parole Gallery, there was a large, man-shaped sculpture. This sculpture was precisely that of the number one Grand Master Sculptor, Parole. The entire Parole Gallery was extremely quiet. Virtually everyone, regardless of status, spoke in hushed tones, so as to avoid bothering anyone else. Yale, Reynolds, George, and Lindley viewed one stone sculpture after another, and in their hearts they felt as though these sculptures truly were incomparably beautiful. The Pruel Gallery's exhibits are divided into three halls, the Main Hall, the Experts Hall, and the Master's Hall. This Main Hall is filled with sculptures that some sculptors arrange to be placed here, to be valued and bought by others as they see fit. Each work is exhibited for a month, and after a month, the highest bid wins the sculpture. These ordinary sculptures are mostly just worth a few gold coins, with particularly good ones worth a few dozen coins. Yale laughed as he explained. But the experts' hall is different. The experts' exhibition is divided up into many individual rooms, with each sculpture in a room by itself. Generally speaking, an expert is someone whose sculpting ability has received general acclaim, and most expert sculptures are worth around a thousand gold coins or so. As for the Master's Hall, that's even more amazing. In the innermost sanctum of the gallery, there are a very small number of master sculptures. The price of these sculptures is frighteningly high. Any of them are easily worth tens of thousands of gold, and some of the masterpieces which first brought fame to their master sculptors are easily worth hundreds of thousands of gold pieces. Yale explained to his three brothers in detail. Lindley's breath stopped. Any masterpiece by a master sculptor was worth tens of thousands of gold coins. To a master sculptor, money really meant nothing at all. But it is quite difficult for a master sculptor to produce a masterpiece, since they nationally don't want to make any mistakes at all. Yale sighed as he spoke. A masterpiece that is worthy of being venerated throughout the ages, requires talent, ability, and sometimes a sudden spark of genius. The works in this main hall are just a bit pleasing to the eye, is all. Let's go inside. Yale led them deeper within. Walking within the quiet parole gallery, and listening to that peaceful music, Lindley felt as though he were swimming in a sea of culture. And just at this time, Doran Coward flew up from within the coiling dragon ring and began to appraise the art nearby. Terrible, 
terrible. How can people have the face to bring out artwork of this quality to show others? Doring Cowart said unhappily. Grandpa Doring, Lindley turned to look at Doring Cowart. This is just the main hall of the parole gallery. There is an expert's hall up front, as well as a master's hall. Parole gallery? Doring Cowart started, and then actually stopped talking. Grandpa Doring, Grandpa Doring? Lindley mentally called out a few times. But seeing that Doring Cowart was still lost in his thoughts, Lindley no longer tried to call to him. He followed Yale, Reynolds, and George to the experts' hall. This hall really was different, as within the center of the main hall, each and every artist had their information recorded and the location of their displays recorded. Yale, Lindley, and the others began to enter the individual display rooms. Although he didn't know much about sculpture, Lindley could still clearly feel that the sculptures of the experts were clearly different than those in the main hall. They seemed to carry within them some sort of ineffable grace and culture. Just as Lindley was falling into a reverie while enjoying the sculptures, Doring Coward's voice sounded out in his mind once again. Not bad. These at least can be considered accomplished. Doring Coward sighed with praise. But compared to the works of Perule, there's still quite a way to go. Lindley was speechless. Doring Coward. How can these people possibly compare to Grand Master Perule? Lindley shook his head and laughed helplessly. Perule was the number one sculptor in the entire history of the Yolam continent. Doring Cowart frowned. Stroking his beard unhappily, he said, What is it? Do you think that Perule was a Grand Master from birth? He, too, started as an ordinary sculptor and worked his way up, and becoming a true Grand Master sculptor in the end. Lindley was stunned. There was some logic to Grandpa Doring's words. After finishing inspecting the experts' hall, Lindley and the other three headed for the innermost master's hall. Everyone, remember, while within the master's hall, don't touch anything. If you break anything, it would be disastrous. Yale reminded them. Entering the master's hall. Silence. The master's hall was extremely large but there were only very few sculptures inside. After all, only so many masters had ever existed, and each master had only four or five works of art on display. In the entire hall, there were only twenty or thirty works on display. But although there were very few sculptures, when Lindley and the others saw these sculptures, they felt a spirit emanating from them, as though these sculptures had life. Oh, not bad, not bad. I didn't expect that in 5,000 years, the art of stone sculpting would reach such a height. Doring Cowart said in amazement. If these can improve a bit more, they will be able to approximate Perule's level. Silently mesmerized within the art gallery, Lindley and the others felt their spirits be uplifted. Dot. Night. The Ernst Institute's main gate. Lindley and other three dismounted the carriage. Second bro, third bro. The two of you, Uck. I planned for us to have a good time tonight in Fenlai City, but you dot Uck, you guys are so thin-skinned. I started having fun in those places when I was six years old. Yale was still unhappily grumbling non-stop. Right on, right on, Reynolds said from the side. George and Lindley glanced at each other, and couldn't help but chuckle bitterly. Quick, open the gate. A furious, urgent shout rang out. Lindley and the others couldn't help but swivel to take a look. They saw a curly-haired youth carrying another bloody youth, with a pretty girl by his side. The bloody youth's face was ashen white. His left arm was broken, with white bones sticking out, and chest covered with claw marks. Looks like some of the trainees who went to the mountain range of magical beasts were wounded. What group is this? We haven't even been at the Ernst Institute for a year but we've seen so many high-level students who were injured outside," Yale said casually. The mountain range of magical beasts was east of the Holy Union. As a matter of fact, it was quite close to the Ernst Institute, perhaps just a hundred kilometers away. Generally speaking, those in good shape would be able to jog from the mountain range to the Ernst Institute in about half a day. Here at the Ernst Institute, I've seen so many magical beasts. Wow. Man, there are flying beasts, running beasts, and all sorts of beasts. 
but most of the people who have magical beast companions at the Ernst Institute are Magus instructors, and a few high-level students. George sighed in admiration. Just as the four brothers arrived at the main gate, suddenly dash. Linley. A familiar voice sounded out. Turning his head to look, surprised joy appeared on Linley's face. Uncle Hillman. Book 2, Growing Up, Chapter 23, A Wonderful Surprise. Hillman was standing in a corner near the gate. Smiling, he walked over. The Ernst Institute has extremely strict management. They actually denied me entrance and just had a guard go looking for you. I didn't expect you would actually be outside. Yale, you guys go on ahead, I'll join you later. Lindley turned his head and said. Yale, George, and Reynolds all smiled at Hillman, then entered the Ernst Institute. Uncle Hillman, why are you here? I thought you would only come here to pick me up after the semester ends? Lindley said questioningly. Let's talk over here. Hillman pulled Lindley off to a side, a look of irrepressible excitement appearing on his face. Lindley, I have wonderful news for you, extremely wonderful news. Lindley's eyes shone. What news? Lindley urged him. Hillman smiled. Lindley, do you remember little Wharton's date of birth? Of course. January 3rd. What, does this have something to do with his birthday? Lindley questioned. Hillman laughed. It is December right now, so little Wharton is almost six years old. Just last night, your father tested little Wharton for the density of dragon blood in his veins in the ancestral hall. And the test result was dot ha ha. Hillman once again began to laugh. Lindley's heart rate sped up dramatically. The dragon blood density test result was. Could it be? Lindley asked. Did the dragon blood density in Little Wharton's veins reach the cutoff? Hillman laughed loudly and nodded. Right. Your father was absolutely ecstatic. He excitedly drank wine with me until midnight. Your father said that his two sons are the absolute prides of his life. One is a mighty magus, and the other is a dragon blood warrior. Ha ha. Wonderful. Lindley's heart was full of excitement. The five millennium old legendary dragon blood warrior clan's prospects, prior to Warden being tested for the dragon blood density, had previously been carried on Linley's shoulders alone. The greater their former glory was, the heavier the burden Linley had been carrying. But now, his own little brother's dragon blood density was sufficiently high that with just a few decades of hard work, he could become a world renowned dragon blood warrior. I came here today to tell you this wonderful news. Your father said to me that right now, the strongest people in Washington Township are myself and him. We are both warriors of the sixth rank. Our level of expertise isn't enough to provide good tutelage for your little brother, and the training methods of your clan are written down but unclear. Hillman's face grew solemn. Thus your father has decided to send your little brother to the O'Brien Empire's O'Brien Academy to study. In that mighty military empire, in the finest military academy, your little brother will receive the best tutelage available. Lindley agreed as well. A person who only had tremendous brute strength but lacked in technique and experience could only be considered a big, dumb ape. Wait. Lindley frowned as he looked at Hillman. Uncle Hillman, that O'Brien Academy's tuition must be extremely high. Although they will allow their own students to study free of charge, no doubt they are extremely merciless in charging out of Empire students. Lindley clearly remembered how much Reynolds had paid to be admitted to the Ernst Institute. Hillman nodded. The O'Brien Academy's yearly tuition is approximately 5,000 gold coins. Your father intends to have housekeeper Harry escort Wharton there and take care of him. The tuition fee really is high. In 10 years, it'll be 50,000 gold coins. 50,000 gold coins would approximately equate to the entire value of all of the Baruch clan's possessions, if sold off. Right. Uncle Hillman. Hillman looked questioningly at Lindley as he watched Lindley withdraw a magic crystal card from his pockets. Hillman was shocked. A magic crystal card? Previously, when he was a soldier, he had seen magic crystal cards before. Lindley, how do you have a magic crystal card? Not even your father has one. Hillman looked at Lindley with surprise. Lindley tugged Hillman and said, 
I won this magic crystal card from a rich kid who lost a magic duel with me. Let's go to the Golden Bank of the Four Empires. Right now, the guards at the Ernst Institute's entrance no longer attempted to bar Hillman's passage, because they recognized Linley, who had left earlier this morning. To Linley, this extra money didn't have too much usage. If he could use it to help his family, that would be enough. Dot. Washington Township, within the Baruch Clan Manor's main hall. Hogg was pondering. Since his clan had produced a descendant with the requisite density of dragon blood, he must be given the best upbringing. Even if they had to beggar themselves, it would be worth it. This was without question. Who should I sell the stone carving screen in the bedroom to? Philip is too stingy, he won't give a good price. Hogg was pondering non-stop. The tuition needed to send little Wharton to the O'Brien Academy was astonishingly high. The question in Hogg's mind right now was how to sell his clan's possessions for a sufficiently high price. Suddenly, footsteps sound out. Turning his head, Hogg said, Hillman, you are back. Uh, what's set on your shoulders? Hillman tossed the bag across his shoulders onto the floor. The bag collided into the floor with a heavy thud sound. Clearly, it was very heavy. Lord Hogg, Lindley asked me to bring this to you. Hillman opened the bag and then poured everything out. One small, gold-colored sack after another formed a small mound on the floor, and the sound of gold coins clinking within the gold-colored sacks was very clear and crisp. These gold-colored sacks were used solely by the Golden Bank of the Four Empires. Each bag generally contained a hundred gold coins. Gold coins? So much gold. There must be at least ten thousand gold coins here. Hawk stared at Hillman, astonished. Hillman, you say that Lindley asked you to bring this here? Hillman said solemnly, in total, nine thousand, nine hundred gold coins. Lindley asked me to bring this to you. At the Ernst Institute, a rich young fellow engaged in a magical duel with Lindley, and in losing, also lost ten thousand gold coins. Lindley stored them into a magic crystal card, and now, has withdrawn the entire balance. Hillman still remembered the words that Lindley had said to the attendant at the Golden Bank of the Four Empires. Withdraw everything. 9,900 gold coins? Lindley's? Staring at the mound of gold-colored sacks, Hogg immediately grew silent. Book 2, Growing Up, Chapter 24, The Straight Chisel School Many days later, at the Ernst Institute. It was morning. Lindley had eaten breakfast, and was now headed to the back mountains, preparing to begin training. While walking on the road out of the Institute, the little shadow mouse was on Lindley's shoulders, scanning about in all directions. There were quite a few people at the Ernst Institute who had magical beast companions, and thus no one cared at all that Lindley had a little shadow mouse as a companion. But just at that moment, that guy is Lindley, the number one magus amongst us first graders. A clear voice rang out from not too far up ahead. Lindley couldn't help but stare at the direction of the voice, and saw two cute girls chatting to each other while staring at him. When Lindley glanced at them, the two girls began to titter in a quiet voice. I've become famous. Lindley mocked himself. Over the past few days, he would often run into people discussing him. Since he had defeated Rand, the victor of the first grade tournament, Everyone had tacitly agreed that he was the number one expert amongst first graders. Oh, in front is? Lindley suddenly saw a slender, small frame up ahead. Short golden hair, with a body as slender as that of Reynolds. A cold aura emanated from him as he calmly walked along the road. Dixie? Lindley's pupils contracted. Dixie was nine years old as well, and in fact was actually a month younger than Lindley but this nine-year-old child had already become a magus of the third rank. Although it became harder and harder to progress in the higher ranks, a nine-year-old magus of the third rank was still very astonishing. It's Dixie. I heard that yesterday at the annual magus assessment test, Dixie shows that he had already reached the requirements for the fourth rank. A number of 17 and 18-year-old girls said from the side. Most of the students in the third grade were more than 16 years old with only the genius Dixie as a clear exception. Omegas of the fourth rank. Lindley felt his heart violently shudder. 
They were both nine years old, and Dixie was even a month younger than him. But he had already become a magus of the fourth rank, while Lindley was only of the second rank. Demeanor as cold as ice, Dixie walked past Lindley. The absolute genius, Dixie. No one his age could come close to matching him. A white line shone out of the coiling dragon ring, and Doran Coward appeared beside Lindley, smiling. Lindley, there actually isn't a huge difference between you two. When Dixie enrolled, his spiritual essence was 68 times that of his peers. This means that even before training, his spiritual essence had reached the level of Amagus of the third rank. That's why in his first year, all he had to do was accumulate sufficient much force for him to become Amagus of the third rank. By now, he's been at the Ernst Institute for almost two more years, so it is very normal for him to become Amagus of the fourth rank. Lindley understood this in his heart. This person simply had too much natural talent. He was born with tremendous spiritual essence, and he had exceptional elemental affinity as well. Clearly, he must have accumulated much force very quickly as well. Although his training speed right now is fast, I expect him to need another three or four years to advance from the fourth rank to the fifth rank. And to go from the fifth rank to the sixth rank, he will need four or five years. Right now, you are a magus of the second rank, while he is of the fourth rank. But I am confident that in ten years, you will catch up to him. Doran Coward said confidently. But Lily didn't believe it. Grandpa Doring, the more natural talent one has, the faster one will progress. He has much more talent than I do, and holds two more ranks than I do. How could I possibly catch up to him in ten short years? Lindley was no fool. His studies at the Ernst Institute had made him aware of how difficult it was for Amagus to advance a rank. In the past, Doring Coward had told Lindley that he would become Amagus of the sixth rank in ten years, but Lindley had always had reservations about that claim. After all, to date, his rate of improvement was clearly insufficient. As he said these words, Lindley had already left the gates of the Ernst Institute and entered the back mountains. As he passed through the mountain forests, Doran Coward suddenly said, Lindley, go to a place next to the mountainside. Next to a mountainside? Lindley was confused. Don't ask too many questions. When you arrive, I'll explain. Doran Coward laughed. Most of the back mountain was covered with wild grass and many different large trees. But after a while, Lindley found a place that satisfied Doran Coward's requirements. The place was a mountain peak that rose hundreds of meters into the air. At the base of the peak, Lindley stood. Grandpa Doring, what do you want me to do here? Lindley said questioningly. Laughing, Doring Coward said, Lindley, do you disbelieve my claim that I can let you reach his level in ten short years? Ha ha dot Lindley, as a mighty saint level Grand Magus, I, in fact, am in possession of a method to improve one's spiritual essence. A method to improve one's spiritual essence? Isn't the meditative trance enough for that? Lindley stared at Doring Cowart questioningly. Doring Cowart smiled calmly. Lindley, I will admit that the meditative trance has very good results. But after meditating, one will feel extremely tired. Of course I would feel tired. The meditative trance involves me using my spiritual essence nonstop. After totally exhausting my spiritual essence, I would then allow it to recover. It'd be strange if it wasn't exhausting. Lindley frowned. Doran Coward proudly said, but my method is different. It doesn't cost spiritual essence at all. In fact, it is a form of entertainment. Entertainment? Lindley was dazed. Right. This form of entertainment is, stone sculpting. A prideful look appeared on Doran Coward's face. Stone sculpting? Lindley said astonished. Like the sculptures in the Pruel Gallery? Doran Coward smiled and said, right. When others sculpt stone, they will exert a lot of energy and exhaust themselves. But my stone sculpting method is different. Although it is also tiring when you first begin to train in it, towards the end, it will have extremely good results. Are you serious? Lindley couldn't quite believe it. Doran Coward stared at him. Lindley, you don't believe me? As a venerable saint-level Grand Magus of the Bund Empire, in the past, 
There were several sculptures I made which nobles offered a million gold coins to purchase. But how could I, a saint-level Grand Magus, be willing to give the sculptures which I was the most proud of to others? You were that good? How come I've never heard of your name amongst the other Grand Master sculptors, then, Grandpa Doring? Linley said suspiciously. Doring Coward said awkwardly, Well, I hid all of my works in an underground vault which no one knew about. After five thousand years, I'm no longer even sure where it is located. Five thousand years is enough for a seat to turn into farmland. The entire Bund Empire had been eliminated. Who knew where the vault was now? Oh ho, so no one's ever heard of you? Lindley began to chortle. You don't believe me? Doring Coward stared at him. Back in the day, when Pruel was just a young kid, he came to me and earnestly begged me to allow him to view my sculptures. After analyzing my sculptures, that kid Pruel had a mental breakthrough which in the end allowed him to become a Grand Master Sculptor. As a matter of fact, he can even be considered a student of mine. Linley was stunned. Pruel? Linley was truly terrified now. Pruel, the man who had been acclaimed throughout the ages at the finest sculptor in history, could be considered a student of Doring Cowart. Of course, if one can describe Pruel's works as being in pursuit of perfection, my works are in pursuit of a different extreme. I named my sculpting method the Straight Chisel School. The Straight Chisel School is totally different from all other sculpting methods. It pursues a totally different extreme. This method, in the beginning, is very exhausting, but as one masters it, you will realize its true fruits. A look of absolute confidence was on Doring Cowart's face. Glancing at Linley, a smile appeared on Doring Cowart's face. But of course, in the past, I was the only member of the Straight Chisel School. From today forward, you will be a second member. In his heart, Linley had total confidence in Grandpa Doring, so of course he had decided to study sculpting with him. And what's more? If Grandpa Doring's words were true, and he could grow stronger while also becoming a master sculptor, just based on his sculpting skills alone, he would be able to support his little brother's tuition. Written, recorded history goes back only a few tens of thousands of years at most. In the long ages before then, before the writing system had even been invented, stone sculpting had already existed. Doring Cowart said with a sigh. Hundreds of thousands of years, or even millions of years ago, our ancestors would record their memories and their visions in sculptures. This is the most ancient method of recording culture and history. Lindley nodded as well. There was no form of culture at all which was older than stone sculpting. Throughout the ages, sculpting has always been very hard to do. And creating a sculpture with unique aura is even harder. The harder something is to do, the more valuable a success would be. Doring Cowart sighed emotionally. Lindley agreed in his heart. If you wanted to paint a single stroke, you could easily do so. But if you wanted to carve out a paint stroke, it would be extremely difficult, because stone is too unyielding. A stone's appearance, quality, grains, and coloration impact not only its appearance, but its entire potential and true form. We use chisels to remove the excess parts and allow its natural beauty to be revealed. This is stone sculpting. The stone sculpting way is really a way of controlling space and appearance. When stone sculpting, one must carve from the outside to the inside, one step at a time, slowly drawing out a form from within. And then, slowly, one would remove the excess parts, allowing the form to become more and more clear. This will allow the sculptor to naturally feel as though his work of art is evolving beautifully. Dot. Once he started, Doring Coward couldn't stop talking about carving. But Linley could clearly tell how much Doring Coward revered this art. Most stone sculpting methods use many tools, such as the butterfly chisel, a straight chisel, a skew chisel, a triangular chisel, a jade bowl knife, hammers, saws, and more. The reason there are so many tools is because stone is very firm and hard. Thus, they will use a butterfly chisel to draw the form the straight chisel for the initial cuts, the triangular chisel. Listening to him speak, Lindley began to understand more about the basics of stone sculpting. Doran Cowart suddenly laughed. But my stone sculpting method is totally different from that of others. 
This is because my stone sculpting method uses only a single tool, the straight chisel. This is why I have named my sculpting method, the straight chisel school. How is that possible? You carve just using a straight chisel? Lindley immediately argued. You just said yourself that more tools are needed. For example, the scales of a fish. How would you use a straight chisel to carve that? Isn't that totally impossible? Wrong. Although others cannot, we earth style magi can. Doran Cowart said confidently, earth style magi can totally sense the entirety of a rock's form. With sufficient wrist strength, we can sculpt stone using just a straight chisel. But of course, the straight chisel school is not a simple one to enter. Today, your mission is to go purchase a sufficiently sharp straight chisel. From today onwards, every day, I will spend three hours guiding you in learning how to sculpt stone. Book 2, Growing Up, Chapter 25, Six Years The flowing water continued to swirl as Lindley sat cross-legged next to it. In his hands, he held a straight chisel and a rock the size of his palm. Begin with the basics. I'll start with this little rock as I begin my training. Lindley sat there alone in the mountains behind the Ernst Institute. Under the tutelage of Doran Cowart, he began to study the art of stone sculpting. As he began to understand more and more about this art, Lindley also began to understand why in the later stages, the straight chisel school could assist in improving one's spiritual essence. When others carved, they needed to use a large pile of tools. They had to spend a huge amount of time and mental energy just considering what tools to use where. Naturally, this would be exhausting. Every single work of art represented their blood and painstaking effort. But the straight chisel school was different. The only tool used was a straight chisel, so there was no need to consider what tool should be used for what. Naturally, the difficulty level was greatly heightened due to the use of just one tool. For example, using the straight chisel to carve out the parts normally reserved for the jade bone knife required an extremely perfect understanding and grasp of the basic form of a stone. In addition, great strength was needed. If one tried to use just a straight chisel on some larger pieces which normally would require a saw to cut through, one would need sufficient strength. One could use an earth style magus unique connection to the earth to understand a stone's essence. But wrist strength had to be trained. As a magus of the second rank, Lindley's wrist strength was not bad, but it was only enough to carve some smaller pieces. If he wanted to carve anything large, his wrist strength would not be enough. However, right now, Lindley was just working on the basics. Dot. When the school year came to an end, Lindley returned to Washington Township. After the new year, Little Wharton and his older brother, Lindley, had only a few days to spend in each other's company. And then, under the auspices of housekeeper Harry, Wharton headed towards the O'Brien Empire. Lindley had no choice but to wistfully watch Little Wharton depart. Crying nonstop, six year old Wharton parted from ten year old Lindley and headed off. Time passed. Lindley continued to be a solitary figure at the Ernst Institute. The vast majority of his time each day was spent in arduous straining at the back mountains. Entering a young adult's growth period, Lindley's appetite increased enormously, and he began to grow taller as well. Naturally, his physical strength and musculature also improved rapidly. In the art of stone sculpting, with Doran Cowart's guidance and his own hard work, Lindley continued to make progress. Dot. Spring went, autumn came. Flowers blossomed, flowers withered. In the blink of an eye, three years passed. At a waterfall in the mountains behind the Ernst Institute. Roar, roar. Like a solid sheet of water, the waterfall poured down in torrents, smashing into the deep pool of water. Lindley was right next to the waterfall, wielding a 30 centimeter straight chisel in his hand as he constantly chipped away at a man-sized block of stone. The straight chisel in his hands danced in an almost illusionary fashion. Every place the straight chisel passed saw scraps of stone detach and fall down. An embryo of a statue was beginning to take shape from the stone. He continued from morning until evening, and the statue's form began to grow clearer and clearer. Lindley's gaze was totally fixed upon the stone. At this moment, 
his entire being was focused on the stone and permeated it, as his heart had become one with the inside of the stone. This marvelous feeling caused Linley not to even notice the passage of time. This sensation of being totally one with nature actually caused Linley's spiritual energy to begin to regenerate, and even grow organically. But Linley himself did not notice this, as he continued to wield the straight chisel and unceasingly work on the statue. Pieces of excess stone continued to fall down, causing each detail of the statue to grow more pronounced. By the time the sun had set, the straight chisel in Lindley's hands finally came to a halt. Phew! Lindley let out a soft breath and brushed away some small pieces of excess stone still remaining. The entire statue had taken shape. A half-meter-long lively-looking mouse stood in front of Lindley. At a glance, one might mistake it for a real mouse. This caused the little shadow mouse, Bebe, to begin squeaking wildly. From start to finish, this was done at one go. What an amazing feeling! Only now did Linley realize that his spiritual essence had improved dramatically. A white-robed Doring coward smiled at him cheerily from the side. Linley, starting today, you can just barely be considered to have mastered the basics. Have you felt that special feeling yet? But your work can only be considered to be a superficial pseudo-artwork. It's only worthy of being placed in the standard hall at the Pruel Institute. If you show it off there, I would be humiliated. Destroy it. Yes, Grandpa Doring. The straight chisel in Lindley's hand flashed many times, and the statue suddenly became divided into more than ten pieces. This year, Lindley finally had mastered the basics of stone sculpting. And this year, Lindley was thirteen years old. Day after day, year after year. After mastering the basics of stone sculpting, Lindley's spiritual essence began to improve at a much more rapid pace. Specifically, when Lindley was nine and a half, he had become a magus of the second rank, and when he was eleven, he had become a magus of the third rank. And when he was thirteen, he had become a magus of the fourth rank. Magi found it harder and harder to advance in ranks as they grew more powerful. Logically speaking, from the fourth to the fifth rank, it should have taken Lindley at least three years. But in reality, in year 9996 of the Yulon calendar, when Lindley was fourteen and a half, he reached the rank of Amagus of the fifth rank. From the fourth rank to the fifth rank, he only spent a year and a half. It was even faster than when he advanced from the third to the fourth rank. This was the benefit of entering the straight chisel school. Dot. Year 9997 of the Yulon calendar was the seventh year Linley had spent at the Ernst Institute. This year, Linley was 15 years old. Wearing a sky blue robe, Linley was walking on the road within the Ernst Institute. On Linley's shoulders, the little shadow mouse Bebe continued to stand. Although six or seven years had passed, Bebe's body hadn't changed in the slightest. By now, Linley was 1.8 meters tall and gave off a very steady, stable air. Earth and wind elemental essences had continuously nourished his body. Combined with Linley's non-stop training, and the advantages provided by his dragon blood warrior heritage, Linley had already become a warrior of the fourth rank. He could easily lift boulders which weighed hundreds of pounds, and shatter rocks with his punches. His study of the straight chisel school of stone sculpting had also caused Linley's spiritual lessons to constantly improve ever since he was 13. At the start of year 9997 of the Yulon calendar, Linley entered the fifth grade class at the Ernst Institute, the same grade as the Ernst Institute's number one genius, Dixie. It had taken Dixie three years to advance from the fourth rank to the fifth rank, but up until now, he still had not been able to advance from the fifth rank to the sixth. Fifteen years old. Amagus of the fifth rank. Linley and Dixie both could definitely be considered freaks of nature. But in the hearts of the vast majority, Linley was even more of a freak, because since the day he took the ability assessment for the fourth rank, he had spent only a year and a half before attaining the fifth rank. Linley's astonishing rate of improvement had shocked everyone. Now, Linley was ranked along with Dixie as being the publicly acknowledged two ultimate geniuses of the Ernst Institute. Look, it is Linley. Two years ago, he became a magus of the fourth rank, and just last year, 
He became Omegas of the 5th rank in just one year. Too amazing. I predict that Lily will become Omegas of the 6th rank before Dixie does. Lindley spends every day training in the back mountains. I hear that recently, Dixie has also begun to train hard at the rear mountains. Most likely, he's being influenced by Lindley. Very possible. Given Lindley's astonishing rate of improvement, very possibly he will supplant Dixie and become the number one genius of the Ernst Institute. Dot. On the street, there were many people who, upon seeing Lindley, began to discuss him amongst themselves. As the acknowledged genius of the Ernst Institute, no matter where he went, people would discuss him. But although Lindley's strength continued to increase, he still refused to participate in the yearly tournaments. Genius? Lindley mocked himself. Lindley had never considered himself a genius. His strength came from intensive training every single day. For six years, he had been as steadfast as he was the first day. And that, combined with guidance from Grandpa Doring, was what gave him his current accomplishments. But right now, my strength is actually less than that of Bibi's. Lindley glanced at Bebe on his shoulders. Bebe, what rank of power have you reached? Squeak squeak. Bebe smirked at Lindley, then said to him mentally, I don't know either, since I've never competed against any other magical beasts. But you definitely aren't a match for me, he he. Bebe was extremely self-satisfied. Totally ignoring the worshipful gazes aimed at him by bystanders, Lindley calmly left the Ernst Institute by the back gate and entered the mountains, once more beginning his solitary training. Those six years which went by like one day were the reason for his success. Lindley quickly and casually floated through the forests, while the little shadow mouse Bebe continued to chat with him non-stop through their mental link. Boss, when are we gonna go to the mountain range of magical beasts to test our strength? You are already a magus of the fifth rank. You can begin to test yourself. And I, Bebe, will finally be able to show my awesome abilities. No rush. Lindley's reply was very short. You are breaking my heart, man. I'm a magical beast, but I haven't gone to the mountain range of magical beasts a single time. What a tragedy. After six years, Bibi's abilities at self-expression had improved dramatically. Quiet. If you keep on making a fuss, then today I won't help you cook meat. As soon as Lindley spoke these words, Bebe immediately shut his mouth and didn't make a sound. After entering the mountains, Doring Cowart appeared by his side. Watching Lindley, Doring Cowart felt extremely gratified in his heart. Lindley. Doring Cowart suddenly said. Lindley turned his head and smiled at Doring Cowart as he engaged in mental conversation. Grandpa Doring, is something the matter? Doring Cowart smiled. Based on your last few works of art, I can formally inform you that your abilities in stone sculpting have met the threshold. Lindley's eyes involuntarily shone. His grandpa Doring had an eccentric temperament. Any works of art which didn't reach his exacting standards had to be destroyed immediately. Per her words, if these works of art were to appear in the world, they would lose face for my straight chisel school, and lose face for me, an honorable saint-level grand magus. Thus, Lindley had been forced to destroy every single sculpture he had made, even though they could have been sold for some money. Met the threshold? Grandpa Doring, did you mean? Lindley stared at Doring Cowart in amazement. Doring Cowart happily nodded. Right. Starting today, after you finish a stone sculpture, you don't need to destroy it. They are worthy of remaining in this world. Naturally, if you wish, you can deliver your sculptures to the Pruel Gallery to sell them and thus begin to build up a reputation for our straight chisel school. At the same time, you can make a bit of gold for yourself. Book 3, Mountain Range of Magical Beasts, Chapter 1, Stone Sculpting Part 1 The warm, comfortable rays of the spring sun shone down upon the brothers of Dorm 1987, who were resting in their backyard. Yale, George, and Reynolds were all engaged in idle conversation. By now, Yale and George were both 16 years old, while Reynolds was now 14. The three of them had quickly gained in height, and even the shortest Reynolds was now 1.6 meters tall. The tallest of them was Yale, at an astonishing 1.9 meters. George, 
Stop faking in front of the two of us. Even fourth bro has lost his virginity. Why are you in third bro still faking? How about this? At the end of this month, why don't you and third bro both go to Finlay City's Jade Water Paradise? I'll handle the expenses. I guarantee that both of you will be extremely comfortable, and I'll also guarantee that the girl will also be a virgin. Deal? Holding two small stone weights, Yale was doing a chest workout while laughing as he spoke. Those two stone weights each most likely weighed around 20 to 30 pounds. Lindley generally disdained such light weights. George laughed as well. Boss Yale, stop trying to force us. Why don't you guys go to the Jade Water Heaven while Third Bro and I go drinking? Isn't that a better idea? Reynolds mocked from the side, George, you, simply aren't a man at all. George could only laugh helplessly. Suddenly, footsteps could be heard from outside the courtyard. Yale put down the two stone weights and headed towards the courtyard exit while saying, I bet it is Third Bro. Come on, time to eat. Before he finished his words, Yale suddenly went silent. He solemnly stride forward, carrying a huge rock on his shoulders, at least three feet high and a hundred pounds heavy. But Lindley clearly was carrying this boulder into the dorm with ease. Yale, George, and Reynolds all stared, slack-jawed. Lindley casually set down the giant rock in a corner of the courtyard, and the weighty sound of the rock slamming into the ground made all their hearts tremble. What the hell? Third bro, I know you are strong, but how are you this strong? Yale stared at the boulder. Is the boulder hollow or something? As he spoke, Yale moved forward and stretched out his hands, giving the boulder a test. H-R-R-R-R-N-G-H. Yale used all of his strength, and his entire face flushed dark red, but that giant boulder seemed to be rooted into the earth as it didn't budge at all. Boss Yale, stop wasting your energy. There's no way you can move it. Lindley laughed. Yale's physical strength was weaker than that of even a warrior of the first rank. How could he lift it? Reynolds stared at the boulder with round eyes. Letting out a few surprised breaths, he suddenly turned his head and stared at Lindley questioningly. Hey, Lindley, why did you bring such a huge boulder into our dorm? Oh, I know. Reynolds' eyes lit up. I've seen powerful warriors use their hands to lift up giant boulders as a form of weight training. Are you preparing to start weightlifting, Lindley? Such a huge boulder could smash me into meat paste. George stared at the boulder, also letting out a few surprised breaths before turning to look questioningly at Lindley. Third bro, why did you bring this giant boulder into our apartment? Lindley smiled at his three brothers, and he said two words, stone sculpting. Based on what Doring Cowart had said, his sculptures were now qualified to be placed within the standard hall. But it took a lot of time to carve each piece, and usually a day wasn't enough. In the past, he could casually carve at the rear mountains without worrying about making mistakes, but now things were different. Stone sculpting? Reynolds, George, and Yale all stared at Lindley, shock in their eyes. What, is this really shocking? Lindley looked back at his three brothers. Reynolds hurriedly said, It isn't shocking, no. It is extremely shocking. We four brothers have lived together for six or seven years now, but I've never seen you sculpt stone before. Are you planning to start training today? Lindley laughed, who says I've never been trained before. I've been practicing stone sculpting in the rear mountains for over five years now, but this time, after I finish this piece, I plan to take it to the pool gallery and display it there and see if it can be sold for any money. In order to come up with a sufficient amount of money to allow his little brother, Wharton, have sufficient funds to go with housekeeper Harry to the O'Brien Empire to request admittance and training, the Baruch clan had virtually exhausted all of its funds. But despite this, Hogg was still very happy. So what if his family had bankrupted itself? His elder son, Lindley, was a student at the Ernst Institute, and upon graduation would definitely become a powerful magus. And his younger son, Wharton, had the possibility of becoming a dragon blood warrior. Hogg could already foresee the dawning splendor of the Baruch clan. The Pruel Gallery? Upon hearing this, Yale and the other two looked at Lindley in shock. Lindley was the pride of their dorm, 
Storm 1987. Despite being just 15 years old, he had entered the fifth grade at the Ernst Institute, and had been acclaimed alongside Dixie as one of the two ultimate geniuses of the Ernst Institute. Yale and the others all acknowledged Lindley as being a genius, but stone sculpting was an extremely profound art form. Many people would painstakingly train for decades, but still only be considered ordinary sculptors. As an extremely ancient and long-lived art form, how could it be easy for stone sculpting to be mastered? How did Lindley dare to dream that his artworks would be exhibited in the most venerated of art galleries, the Pruel Gallery? Third bro, don't get too carried away. George joked in a consoling manner. Lindley, I'm worried. Dot your sculpture, will anyone actually buy it? Reynolds frowned, a look of disbelief on his face. Yell laughed loudly. Why are you guys acting like this? Third bro, go ahead and put on an exhibit. As long as you have an exhibit, I'll spend 10,000 gold to buy it and help spread your fame. I'm telling the truth. Lindley retrieved a straight chisel from his clothes. Straight chisel? Reynolds said in surprise. Lindley, looks like you've made some preparations. But in the past, I was also prepared to learn stone sculpting, so I know that lots of tools are needed, including the straight chisel the butterfly chisel, the triangular chisel, the jade bowl knife, and tools like saws. What, did you only prepare a single tool? George, Reynolds, and Yale all knew at least some rudiments about art. Lindley didn't say too much. Wielding his straight chisel, Lindley naturally entered a tranquil mental state. His spirit could feel the earth essence flowing through the boulder in front of him, and could even sense, just barely, the veins in it. Smiling, Lindley began to use the chisel. The flashing chisel reflected the light of the sun, causing the nearby Reynolds and the others to squint. But all of them continued to stare at the boulder. Whoosh! Wherever the shadow of the chisel fell, large pieces of stone began to fall as well. How is this possible? Yale watched in astonishment. To remove such a large piece of rock, a saw should be used to chop it. He actually removed it with just a straight chisel. How astonishing must his wrist strength be? Next to him, Reynolds and George both fell totally silent. Wrist strength? To do this in such a manner as casually as Lindley did, with every cut being perfectly even, was not something which could be accomplished just with strong wrists. Lindley was as tranquil as a pond of still water. The straight chisel in his left hand stretched out quickly carving through all parts of the boulder, and pieces of excess stone continuously rained down. The natural, elegant manner in which Lindley carved was a treat to watch. Third bro, he, Yale, George, and Reynolds exchanged glances. At this moment, they all felt in their hearts that perhaps Lindley truly was an expert stone sculptor. Tranquil. Natural. Peaceful. Lindley very much enjoyed the feeling of stone sculpting. At his current level, Lindley didn't have to consider how much effort or strength should be used in any particular place. The straight chisel in his hands would naturally attain the most perfect usage of force. This was a subconscious effect. Compared to the straight chisel school? None of the other schools of stone sculpting could be so effortless. All the experts of the other schools had to consider which of the many various types of tools should be used for each part of the sculpture. This alone was exhausting. In this natural, unrestrained manner, Lindley's stone sculpting led his spiritual essence to rapidly grow, like the grass after a rain. That sensation of natural growth was extremely wondrous to Lindley, making him feel comfortable from his very core. Lindley's right hand suddenly halted. The flying dust and specks of stone took a bit longer to settle, but the outline of a crawling creature could be seen from the boulder. Why are you guys standing there in a daze? All shocked? Lindley laughed as he turned to look at Yale and the others. I've just made a simple outline. There's a lot more time and effort I'll have to spend later. Come on, let's get lunch. Yale, George, and Reynolds all glanced at each other. Just based on what Lindley had just shown them, all three of them were sure of one thing. Genius. Yale said admiringly. A genius amongst experts. George added. Even amongst stone sculptors, 
for someone to be able to reach Lindley's level of proficiency in just five or six years was an event which occurred perhaps once in a century. Book 3, Mountain Range of Magical Beasts, Chapter 2, Stone Sculpting Part 2 Within the Waddley Hotel Per Yale, since we just found out today that Third Bro is an expert stone carver, we absolutely must go out and celebrate. Let's go to the Waddley Hotel. And just like that, the four of them had gone to the Waddley Hotel. As soon as they stepped foot within, many students patronizing the hotel turned to stare at them. The vast majority of the students' gazes were focused on Linley. Dixie, Linley. The most prominent, standout geniuses of the Ernst Institute. Any place they went became a focal point of attention. From far away, many students began to chat amongst themselves in lowered voices. The four brothers were seated, now, and the dishes had just arrived. Squeak squeak. Bebe, who had been napping lazily this entire time, stuck his little head from out of Lindley's robes. His pair of slick, devilish little eyes stared at a gleaming roasted chicken on the table. Reynolds immediately grabbed the chicken and offered it to Bebe. Bebe, come here. Boss Lindley, I'm gonna go eat. Bebe immediately said mentally to Lindley. Before Linley even had the chance to reply, Bebe leapt onto the table, grabbed the chicken, and began to chomp down on it. In less than ten seconds, the entire roasted chicken had been totally devoured by a little shadow mouse that was a full size smaller than it. Third bro, each time when I see how fast Bebe eats, my heart can't help but shudder. Yale laughed. After eating, Bebe turned around to look at Linley. Seeing Grease cover Bebe's paws, Lindley couldn't help but frown. Squeak squeak. Bebe intentionally chirped out twice towards Lindley, and then half closed his eyes in a very self-delighted manner, while at the same time, his entire body radiated a black glow. The black aura expanded, and then, in the blink of an eye, disappeared. But Bebe's two previously oily paws as well as tail was now absolutely clean. Rubbing his small face, Bebe stared at Lindley and chirped once while saying mentally, Boss Linley, clean enough for ya? Linley couldn't help but laugh. Whoosh! With a flicker, Bebe once more burrowed his way into Linley's clothes. And then, the four brothers began to chat and eat. Right, third bro, if you intend to deliver your sculptures to the Perule Gallery, there's a few things you need to keep in mind. Yale reminded Linley. Oh, what do I need to remember? Linley asked. Lindley didn't know a single thing about the system through which the Pruel Gallery accepted new sculptures. Yale smiled. For most sculptures, on the lower left corner, the artist must leave an inscription of his name or pseudonym, signifying that this is your art. That's the first thing. The second thing is that when the sculpture is delivered to the Pruel Gallery, it must be totally sealed and boxed. This is to prevent the sculpture from being damaged while being delivered to the gallery. When the sealed sculpture is delivered to the Pruel Gallery's warehouse, there will be people who will inspect it to see if it is in good condition, as well as take down a detailed recording of your own information. Usually, within three days or so, your artwork will be ready to be displayed at the standard display hall within the Pruel Gallery. Lindley nodded. Leaving behind one's name on one's artwork was done in order to prevent others from falsely claiming the work was theirs. Lindley could also understand the reasoning for requiring the sculpture be boxed and sealed. Some sculptures are carved very exquisitely and delicately. In the shipping process, it is entirely possible that the sculpture might be damaged. If I totally seal it off, and also add lots of paper and cloth padding, it should be much safer. What about pricing and bidding? How does the Pruel Gallery handle this? Lindley asked. The whole point of delivering the sculpture to the Pruel Gallery was for the sake of making money, so as to improve his family's economic situation. Yale said delightedly, the sculptures are placed within the standard hall, and potential buyers are allowed to set any price they want. After a month, the highest bidder will receive the sculpture, while you will get your compensation. Naturally, the Pruel Gallery will receive a 1% transactional commission, with a hard limit of 10 gold coins. If your sculpture exceeds a thousand gold coins in price, the commission of the gallery will still remain just ten gold coins. 
Lenly understood now. Third bro, don't worry. I'll arrange for some people in Fenlai City to take care of everything. I guarantee it'll all be to your satisfaction. Yale smiled towards Linley as he spoke. If the third bro of our dorm delivers a sculpture to the Pruel Gallery and it sells well, I'll gain a lot of face as well. Off on the side, George couldn't help but sigh with praise. Third bro, by now, you are a fifth grade student. In the future, you'll no doubt also be a master sculptor. Your future is boundless. You'll no doubt do much better than us. A master sculptor? Don't flatter me. Linley laughed at himself. The four brothers chatted as they continued to drink and eat. Living in the Ernst Institute really is comfortable, Yale suddenly sighed, putting down his wine cup. I remember when I was young and I lived at home, our family rules were extremely severe. Reynolds quirked his lips as well. We are all students of the Ernst Institute. According to Grandpa Lamu, right now, the world is very chaotic. In the outside world, there is constant warfare and slaughter. The Ernst Institute is backed by the Radiant Church, so no one dares offend it. That's the reason why our lives are so comfortable. In the future, when we go out and train in the real world, we'll see how cruel the world can be. Absolutely correct. Lindley nodded and sighed. I'm a fifth grade student now. Many of my fellow classmates have already gone training in the real world. From what they say, some students die in battle outside, and many are crippled or wounded. Without experiencing real life and death battles, it will be hard for us to grow. We are just like the pets of the noble families. Our lives might be easy, but how can they compare to the viciousness of the real world? George also sighed. I really look forward to the bloody life and death battles which the high-level students will engage in. Those exciting, blood-boiling lifestyles must be extremely stimulating. George, Yale, Reynolds, and Lindley were now all 15 years old. In all of their hearts, there was a thirst for the exciting events of the outside world. But Yale and the others were far too weak. If they embarked now on that lifestyle of life and death battles, their chance of death was far too high. Lindley, you are a fifth grade student now, yes? Reynolds suddenly said. Yale and George also looked at Lindley, their eyes gleaming. Lindley took a deep breath, and nodded. Right. I am now a Magus of the fifth rank. I can be considered a high-level Magus now. In June, I plan to embark on a two-month trip to the mountain range of magical beasts, returning only in August. Lindley had decided long ago. The mountain range of magical beasts? Yale, George, and Reynolds all sucked in a cold breath. The mountain range of magical beasts, the largest mountain range in the Yulam continent, lay less than 100 kilometers east of the Ernst Institute. Many high level students did indeed venture there for their second or third training missions, but most students, for their first training expedition, would select some more ordinary locales. For example, they might take on some low-risk assignments like being a bodyguard or escorting a caravan. Lindley, you plan to go to the mountain range of magical beasts for your very first training expedition? Reynolds couldn't help but ask. George and Yale were also worried. Relax. I have full confidence. Lindley was rather confident in himself. As a magus of the fifth rank and a warrior of the fourth rank, he possessed great speed as a warrior which could be further supported by the wind-style spell, supersonic. Based on his current speed, when combining his speed with this spell, Lindley could reach the speed of a warrior of the sixth rank. And even more importantly, Lindley could utilize the high-level wind spell, floating technique. To listen to the full complete novel plus thousands upon thousands of hours worth of other full novels, go to patreon.com web link. Converting these novels is mind-numbing and insanely time-consuming. Uploading to Patreon removes the additional step of having to also convert the files to video format, which saves a staggering amount of time. Your support is greatly appreciated.